Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are glad to start our session. Uh, today, uh, we will discuss uh, potential partnership, not even potential, the new modes of partnership uh, between the United States of America and the Greater Caspian region. Uh, today, we will have uh, four speakers. Uh, I will moderate the session. My name is Murat Sietnipesov. Uh, I'm the chairman of the organizing committee of the Caspian Week uh, and uh, president of the Greater Caspian Association. Also, I'm involved in the business in the Great Caspian region. Uh, here, I think it's important uh, to explain uh, to, to the audience uh, uh, a little <laughs> bit more about the Greater Caspian region. Uh, it's not only about the Caspian Sea, it's a big region. Uh, I will just uh, uh, name uh, the subregions. It's a country surrounding Caspian Sea, Black Sea, uh, Caucasus, South Caucasus, and uh, Central Asia, up to Afghanistan and Northern Pakistan. Uh, today, uh, we will uh, discuss about this region. This region is a crossroad uh, and the transport and trading hub uh, between the East and West, uh, starting from 2000 and more years ago, from the ancient Silk Road, uh, where the caravans, where the camels and the horses uh, uh, were traveling between uh, the Europe and China and then the Middle East. Uh, this region is uh, extremely rich in the national resor uh, natural resources, uh, starting from the natural gas, uh, oil, uh, mineral resources, uh, and uh, uh, there are 16 countries in the region. Uh, and this region, as I told, uh, extremely important for the world and the potential future point of growth. Uh, I will introduce briefly our speakers uh, today. I will start from my good friend, uh, Ambassador Matthew Breiser. Uh, he is a career diplomat. Uh, he spent 23 years in the diplomatic service uh, in the United States. Uh, his uh, last position was the ambassador of the United States of America to Azerbaijan. Uh, after that, uh, uh, he moved to the Atlantic Council, uh, where he's uh, the senior fellow. Uh, also, he's on the board of many companies uh, working in the, in the region. Uh, he's based in Turkey, uh, and uh, I think his view, and especially today we are, uh, we are at the Horace's United States of America meeting. Uh, last year, one year ago, it was an extraordinary meeting, but uh, after that, looks like Horace's organizing committee decided to do every year uh, U U.S. meeting. And uh, uh, this time is very important, uh, and for the region and for the whole world. Uh, we just... Uh, Two years we were in the COVID crisis, and we were almost thinking, okay, crisis is over. Now we are back to the normal life. Uh, there was a small interruption with the Olympic Games in Beijing. And uh, suddenly we got another crisis, which I think is very serious and very dangerous even. And uh, these, uh, the consequences of this crisis could change the world order. Uh, and uh, uh, Matthew's view on the situation, on the problems, and also on the potential impacts uh, for the economic trade and investments, in particular related to the Greater Caspian region, where he spent a big part of his life. Uh, it's very important uh, for us, uh, for, for the region, and uh, for the audience, uh, and, and for everybody. Uh, now, uh, second speaker will be Grigor Tashkovich. Uh, sorry if I will pronounce. <laughs> correctly or not, your family name. Uh, he's a former minister of uh, economic and trade of the North Macedonia. Uh, he's, uh, he was and he is heavily involved in the region. Uh, he, is a develop he was developing a very interesting project on the pipeline, oil pipeline, uh, like bringing uh, energy security to the region. Uh, then, uh, uh, yes, one second, yes. Uh, then we're expecting also Shamblal Patia to join us. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a former senior minister and a former senior advisor uh, to President uh, Karzai in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, now it's, uh, it is very difficult to discuss about Afghanistan. Uh, it's for, for now, it looks like more like a geographical location. Uh, because uh, we don't know what is happening there. The country is quite closed. Uh, we don't have access there. Uh, but I believe that uh, 
Sham with his, uh, I think, more than 50 years experience in the international relations and diplomacy. Uh, he could be very, uh, could share his views and it could be very interesting for us, uh, for all of us to listen. And uh, the last speaker is about uh, Turtle Boom. Uh, sorry for my, maybe I'm not uh, correctly pronouncing the family name. He is a businessman. Uh, he's uh, the chairman of uh, uh, Delphos. It's a financial advisory firm based in uh, Washington, D.C. But as we discussed, he's based... Uh, oh, Sham is here. Great. Uh, Sham, can you hear me? Ah, you are here. Perfect. Uh, yes. <laughs> he's, uh, uh, I think he's the only one who is now based in the United States. Uh, that's why it is a bit early for him, only 7.15 in the morning. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, coming back to Bart, uh, Bart had a great experience dealing with Uzbekistan, uh, and uh, it will be very interesting uh, to hear his experience, uh, how it was, uh, it was to do business in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, everybody knows, uh, already almost six consecutive years of reforms, massive reforms going on. And uh, as we, uh, this is my favorite country to do business now today in the Greater Caspian region uh, because everything is really friendly and open for international business. Okay, uh, now uh, I will start uh, giving the floor uh, to our speakers. I would like to start from Ambassador Matthew Breiser uh, to share his views on the situation and the consequences uh, which we'll have in the Greater Caspian region. Please, Matthew. Thanks, Murat. And yeah, it's great to be with you, my dear friend. I am so happy to be back with Gleaver again. It's been close to 20 years since we last saw each other uh, when we were actively engaged on discussions about the, then the AMBO oil pipeline. And Gleaver, I'm, I'm always sorry we couldn't get the U.S. government uh, on board, uh, but I'm going to put that project and today in a, in a bit of a historical context because What's happening as we sit here, as we speak in Ukraine, um, has created a new geopolitical world. Uh, what we knew before is no more. Uh, but what was before and why is the U.S. interested in the greater Caspian region? Now, it, it, it always came as a surprise when, when we would have discussions with our Russian counterparts about what our goals were, because they never believed us. But here, here's what we were trying to do. So... Um, Back in the mid to late 1990s, as it was becoming um, appreciated in Washington by then President Clinton, uh, that the largest uh, discovery of oil and natural gas in the world in recent years had, had been made in the Caspian Sea. It was Soviet era fields, but now there was much more happening uh, in the mid 90s. We, we can go into the history even more if we wish. Um, there was an opportunity to create greater liquidity in oil markets uh, and to uh, increase the energy security uh, of our friends like Azerbaijan and Georgia and our NATO allies like Turkey. Uh, and eventually we, we broaden our, our project to include five different pipelines, which included Russian projects. That's imp important to keep in mind. Um, and the goal all the way throughout was to make sure this largest discovery of oil and gas in recent decades could reach markets, global markets and European markets, free from either ge geographic choke points like the Strait of Hormuz or the Turkish Straits, and free from monopoly pressures, monopoly power, especially on, on pipelines, and that meant Russia. Um, but we didn't want it to be an anti-Russian policy. So we supported five pipelines in the beginning. This was in the mid to late 1990s. Um, <clears throat> We supported the CPC pipeline, so from Kazakhstan to Novorossiysk, Russia, on the Black Sea. We supported the Baku-Novorossiysk oil pipeline, from Baku to Novorossiysk, also. Caspian Sea to Russian Black Sea coast. Then there were three projects we supported uh, that bypassed Russia or didn't include Russia. It's the Baku-Supsa early oil pipeline to the Black Sea port of Supsa. And then the, the, the more prominent ones, the baku tbilisi Chehan oil pipeline that connects Azerbaijan, also Kazakhstani oil, and, and we would like to see more Turkmenistani oil from time to time coming into it, but mostly Azerbaijani oil to Georgia and onward to Turkey, and then from the port of Jehan to international, the global market, I should say. And then the fifth pipeline is the natural gas pipeline, uh, originally just called the South Caucasus Natural Gas Pipeline or Baku-Tbilisi-Erzurum 
because where it began and it ended in Erzurum, connecting to the Turkish natural gas grid. And then over the last decade and a half or so, that, that pipeline has expanded considerably and is now um, part of the so-called Southern Corridor, as dubbed by the EU, uh, which includes an expanded Southern uh, uh, South Caucasus gas pipeline, then the Trans-Anatolian pipeline or town up across Turkey to the Greek border, uh, and then from, from inside of Greece through Albania and then under the Adriatic Sea, there's the Trans-Adriatic pipeline that leads to uh, Italy. And from there, the gas is bought by all sorts of purchasers and it's uh, distributed to multiple countries. So that's all in place. And that's, that's, what, that's what brought that whole vision, brought the United States strategic vision to the greater Caspian region. But there's so much more to the greater Caspian region, as Murat described. For goodness sake, there's Afghanistan <laughs> and there's northwest Pakistan. And we've just made a horrible mess out of Afghanistan by virtue of President Trump negotiating <laughs> with the Taliban and not the government of Afghanistan, clearly signaling we were going to run away. And then the Biden administration's debacle uh, of, of, a, of an exit from Afghanistan, which has left that poor country in, in just a horrible state of affairs. And I, I bring that up, not just to lament, but to show that U.S. policy never really connected the post-Soviet space with South Asia or Southwest Asia. We, we never did it. We, I remember a very wise uh, uh, desk officer at the State Department um, for several C Central Asian countries. She said to me, there's no sense discussing stability in Central Asia or Afghanistan without thinking about Pakistan and integrating the policies. But we never did it because of just human nature and the way our bureaucracies were organized. Um, but several times we tried uh, various projects that were always dubbed the New Silk Road. Uh, first one we began in around 2003 when we saw, uh, or 2002, when we saw some uh, green shoots of reform coming up in uh, Kyrgyzstan at the time under then President Arkayev. Uh, we hoped to see more reform. We felt there was some reform happening in Kazakhstan. Uzbekistan was frozen in, in Karimov land. But as Murat said, it is now in a very exciting period of, uh, of reform and of opportunity. So that was then. Uh, and the idea was to, was to support development of an east-west corridor that, of course, began with hydrocarbons, but also broadened out to include telecommunications uh, and surface transport. Uh, included all sorts of logistics routes that Murat knows all about and, and, and participates in, um, and also included the military uh, corridor uh, that connected the United States and its NATO allies from the Black Sea into Afghanistan. Um, and all throughout, we're always trying to figure out, as I said in the beginning, how will Russia be involved? And in recent years, as China has launched its Belt and Road Initiative, um, sometimes China and Russia have spoken about working together, on east-west transportation. But really, even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we started to see that these east-west logistics routes uh, that China was developing under BRI uh, didn't pay too much attention to Russia, but focused instead <coughs> to the post-Soviet Central Asian states, then across the Caspian Sea uh, and into the Black Sea and then global markets. And that, that's been a source of some tension between Russia and China, even as Russia and China uh, have come together uh, in, in opposition to the United States uh, in, in recent years and months, and, and more recently since the Russian attack on Ukraine. So that dynamic now of, of working together with Russia, you know, Kazakhstan, I mean, has a lot of investment at $40 billion in investment from Russia. Uh, Russia is Kazakhstan's really important export market for non-hydrocarbons. Um, all of that interconnectivity with Russia is now called into question because of what's happening now in Ukraine. Um, Kazakhstan has to work out what it's going to do without that investment flow, perhaps from Russia, without its ability to, to of, of common Kazakhstanis to use Sperbank or, or, or Venetia Kolombank as, as normal clients, uh, without maybe an export market. Uh, it was only about $7.1 billion uh, last year in exports from Kazakhstan to Russia, but still the, the, those goods, those finished goods need to find new markets. Um, so what is that going to be? I, I would argue that's going to be more of the East-West corridor, but less of Russia. So Kazakhstan is going to look to Turkey and it's going to look to China to export what was going to Russia. The United States is going to think more than ever about the importance of connecting Central Asia with the South Caucasus and onward to Europe more than ever now, given what's happening in Ukraine. And my last comment is 
Um, I was kind of the point person uh, in the U.S. government uh, when Russia invaded Georgia. And in the in the aftermath, we didn't we didn't do much. The U.S. and Europe didn't do that much. And I, I would argue if we had done more, we, we wouldn't be in the place we are now with Ukraine. But that can be debated ad infinitum. Uh, but one thing we decided to do was to encourage as much interconnectivity as possible uh, among all the post-Soviet states. I'm sorry to use that expression, but it's shorthand. As much uh, interconnectivity among them as possible. So get the Central Asian states working together. We had whatever is the the five plus one or whatever we called that group with the U.S. and the Central Asian states. Uh, Strongly supporting the Southern Corridor, as we always did, to connect uh, uh, Caspian natural gas uh, with European markets via Turkey. Uh, And I think that's going to be the the knee-jerk response now in this region uh, as the U.S. figures out uh, what does it do, not only about Russia, but but how does it deal with China simultaneously? And what if China uses what Russia is doing in Ukraine as a pretext to do something against Taiwan? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you for these exhaustive uh, comments and very interesting. Uh, of course, now it's extremely difficult to do any forecasts and uh, do any analysis because situation is so, uh, I would rather tell, fluctuative and uh and uh, but uh, you are giving some light what could happen and uh, what should be done uh again uh, to rely on this partnership between the united states and the greater caspian region yeah. uh, now i would like to give the floor to ligor uh there are several interesting facts in uh, his biography then when he was the minister of foreign investment of uh, north macedonia he managed to attract over 1.5 billion dollar investments to the country, direct investments. Uh, and uh, North Macedonia was one of the poorest countries uh, in the region. Uh, what you can r- recommend uh, for the Greater Caspian region and for the countries of the Greater Caspian region, what they need to do in order to attract foreign direct investments? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, may I just uh, ask uh, your indulgence, please? We have one man who has a question, and I just don't want to keep him waiting. Maybe I can incorporate my aunt, uh, the answer to his question to my presentation. If we could just ask him, uh, Mr. Zaretsky, uh, w- what you'd like to ask, please. Ah, yes. Just one second. Yes. Please, Daniel. Yeah, he's ghosting us. All right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes the system is not... Uh... <laughs> Boosting our egos. So much fast reaction. Ah. But uh, we can discuss later because okay. I, know... I didn't want him to be here. He, he's here. Oh, okay, okay, one second. He's asking the microphone. Okay, great. <laughs> Daniel, please. Hmm. Daniel? I give him microphone. I'm sorry. Ah, okay, it, yes. It was a mistake. Hey. If I ah. put up my thing, I'll have a question at the end. Sorry, you guys. All right, very good. Okay. Very good. Didn't want you to be waiting. I know what that's like. <laughs> waiting, waiting, waiting. Pick me. No, 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 no. It's, I, I did it by mistake. Sorry. Okay. Great. All right. So uh, your question is, you know, how can the region improve uh, their ability to attract foreign investment? Is that your question? Uh, yes. One of the questions, but uh, <laughs> it's the most interesting. <laughs> but- All right. So, look, um, when I was in Macedonia, we really did several things, right? We worked very closely with the World Bank on what they called their uh, guillotine policy, where we reviewed every single law under Yugoslavia um, and uh, and basically either got them off the books because we inherited that whole legal regime. Right. Got them off the books or updated them for, you know, 2006, 2007 at the time. And so that made our economy less sclerotic and more uh, vibrant. Um, That was number one. Number two is at the time, it's sadly been canceled. And I think probably for knee-jerk reasons rather than good reasons. The World Bank had a project called Doing Business. It was around for maybe 18, 19, 20 years. And they stopped that for, well, I mean, there were some issues, I agree, but I don't think the issues outweighed the reason um, to do it. Uh, But they provided competitive information about different countries uh, around the world, every country around the world, in fact, on how they ranked in terms of the ease of doing business. Um, and that website is doingbusiness.org, I believe. Um, and we competed aggressively on that. If we were, you know, okay, I'll give an example. Uh, 
one of our metrics when we began in my government uh, was the ease of creating a new company, right? How long does it take to complete registration process? It was four, we were at 42 days in Macedonia. I mean, it's insanity, 42 days. Small country of 2 million people, how could it be 42 days? So that was one of my first projects. And we, we sliced and we diced and we went through different iterations of the process, but we got down to four hours and we were on par with Singapore and New Zealand in the world. And we kept that. How much, time it, it, how much time it took from you? I'm not t- talking about the force. I know it's incredible. But uh, uh, how much time it took from 42 days to four hours? We did that over a little over a year. A year, maybe a year and a few months. Great. It's very short. Uh, very short period. Okay, please. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, no, but just as an example. So, you know, there, 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 are, there are, I don't know, I remember exactly 13 other characteristics, such as, you know, the ability to clear bankruptcy, uh, the ability to have, you know, rule of law about contracts, um, some of the other things, uh, the ease of getting electrical connections to your business, uh, stuff like that. And, and so um, we worked very hard at that and we got ourselves from wherever we were at the beginning, which is probably atrocious, down to we were in the top, I think we were in the top 10 in the world, actually, top 10 countries in the world, 12 or 10, something like that, close anyway. Um And uh, yeah, very proud about that. And that made my job easier. So as I, I worked... Uh, investment banking hours. Uh, I traveled to 40 countries, about including about mm, 15 trips to Turkey. I have to say, mm. um, uh, to, um, uh, to and even to Kazakhstan. I, I made it to Kazakhstan uh, to to meet with business people, meet with chambers of commerce, and attract business to to Macedonia. And it was a big funneling effect, right? I met my final report to the prime minister. We met with about 100 C level executives in 40 countries of which 300 came to Macedonia and then, you know, 10% of those invested. Uh, but I, um, but, but, but people in Macedonia weren't used to seeing people work this hard. Uh, mm. And so early on, there's a very funny uh, front page story in the newspaper, um, <clears throat> the government building at two o'clock in the morning and there's one light on in the whole building. And, and the cat and that screaming headline says, Minister Toswich is working for you. And the light oh. was on in my, in my building because everyone else is long since asleep. But the problem was uh, flights from Macedonia to go anywhere left at, you know, 4, 30, 5, 30 in the morning. So I often pulled all nighters to jump on early morning planes to to go somewhere uh, so that I, I could continue my work. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gregor. Also, uh, in your biography, uh, you were really involved in the pipeline projects in the region. Yes. And the energy security issues. Uh, can you also recommend or comment something uh, about this and the recommendation for the Greater Caspian region? Matthew just gave us a uh, good explanation about the history of the five, five projects. Uh, maybe you can, uh, okay, from these five projects, four were, uh, no, all five were materialized. Yeah. Uh, right. the, uh, it took, of course, a lot of efforts and time. Uh, and Gligor, what you can also recommend for the region? Well, Matthew, of course, if I had Matthew on my team, I'd send him to Georgia every two weeks. <laughs> you, were, you, were, you were a yo-yo. <laughs> yeah, I was bouncing. Wow. You were seriously bouncing. Uh, we didn't have those resources, of course. Uh, we require government resources. But the um, uh, but just one, one correction of something uh, Matthew said. Um, we did get support from U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Uh, to do a feasibility study. And we were the only um, one of the five studies they did for oil on the west side of the Black Sea to be successful. So um, that was done in 2000, 2001. And uh, we are still alive today. The other projects have since folded. You can argue easily that we were ahead of our time. But, um, you know, the initial oil went south through Matthew's project to Chehan. And the later oil was subject to a variety of political delays and then even um, physical pipeline issues uh, for, for many, many years. And so now we're at a point where uh, the oil, well, absent current events of the last two weeks, oil is coming in increasing volumes into uh, Novorossiysk through the Cassian Pipeline Consortium that Matthew was working on. And um, uh, the, the backup of the Basra Straits is such that uh, our project is now viable because we've proven the thesis that uh, we can move the oil from a Black Sea to Adriatic Sea um, uh, faster and cheaper and safer than moving it by ship through the Bosphorus Straits. So uh, we have the uh, Qataris, 
on board now to uh, provide financing. Uh, we're in talks with the major shippers, and we're pretty optimistic about 2022 with the caveat that we don't know what's going to happen now with uh, Ukraine and Russia, which could be major, right? So, Thank you. Uh, and also now uh, the routes, uh, uh, export routes for the hydrocarbons from the Greater Caspian region, in particular from the east side, from the Caspian Sea, will be changing. Yeah. And what I uh, what I can hear on the market that uh, exporters and the producers they would like now to go via these uh, pipelines and infrastructure. Uh, we just uh, Matthew explained like BTC pipeline looks like going to be full during the next months. Uh, and uh, also railway infrastructure will be full uh, because uh, people are uh, companies are rerouting uh, export from uh, Russian destination towards the Black Sea destination via Azerbaijan and Georgia. Uh, okay, we have so many people now would like to ask questions. I will uh, just mark this and then we'll see who will ask for the microphone. But uh, uh, I think. Uh, Thank you, Gligor, uh, for these recommendations. I think that this should be very useful uh, for the countries of the Greater Caspian region. Uh, and we have, uh, for example, Uzbekistan now I really would like to attract foreign direct investments uh, to the country. And uh, I am traveling there quite regularly. I have a business there and I see that every six months situation is changing really significantly. And uh, now the uh, government officials on the, in the rank of ministers and deputy ministers, they speak English generally, which is simplifying uh, a lot the process of discussions. Uh, and, uh, and we see that country now booming. That's why I think your recommendation could be very useful, in particular for Uzbekistan. Now I would like to, to invite uh, Minister Shamla Alpatia. Uh, who was a senior minister and a senior advisor to President Karzai in Afghanistan. It is very difficult, of course, now to discuss business, investments, and trade, even logistics with Afghanistan, uh, because uh, we don't know what is going on there. Uh, country is uh, completely locked and uh, not transparent. Uh, and uh, I will be very grateful if Sham could explain us his view <laughs> To his ideas and uh, his uh, like maybe him to do some kind of forecast what will happen in the future and uh, how we can reintegrate Afghanistan uh, into the economic uh, community of the greater Caspian region I am not talking about the world community and also how now in this situation to relaunch the partnership with the United States please Sean. Uh. thank you Murad sorry for you you hear me well I guess Okay. Sure. Sorry, since I'm visiting New York, so my whole sort of approach is from that this perspective because I'm tourist now. But nevertheless, uh, you're right. The Afghan situation has become complex, as my uh, previous colleagues already said. Um, it was miscalculated, miss, 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 many things you can add to it. But whatever happened, it did happen. What can you do now? The situation is, 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 is tough now. At, at, at the ground and at the, at the political level. Uh, there is, of course, all kinds of movements going on to talk to each other, but so far no result has been so that we could really address something in a more concrete manner. That's number one. Afghanistan is important, as I always believed in that. We are not a member of a Caspian region, but whatever happens in the Caspian region affects us. And we also would like to be part of it. Uh, as much as we can, uh, because we have next door to Iran and, of course, Uzbekistan, uh, continue further to, to, to uh, Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan and all that kind of things. We have uh, actually developed a, a, a new path um, called the uh, Lapis Lazuli path, uh, which basically went from Afghanistan all the way to Georgia, for example. Uh, we are working on that part. All those plans and, and initiatives which we took during the Karzai's time, it's still there. It's not that it has disappeared. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, my former colleagues are still there. They're still waiting just to see what next, uh, just once the situation gets clearer. So they're really working on that part as well. In Within the country itself, it's, it's a little confused situation, I must say that. Uh, one 
person is speaking one thing, others are speaking another thing. But at the end of the day, nothing concrete is moving. Um, of course, the current situation has become more and more complicated. The role of China, for example, in Afghanistan, that is also something which we are always thinking very seriously. Um, we are a little bit stuck now in this situation. Now, how far this will go? Well, the reading is, I was speaking just last week um, to, to the previous, my colleagues in, in, in the cabinet colleagues, for example, uh, some of them are in Kabul, some of them are abroad and so on. They're literally lost, they say, but things are moving in the background. And I hope this will move in a more positive way. The current Taliban regime, which is basically Botaki and, for example, the guy who's sitting in the foreign ministry, he may be a very reasonable guy in terms of his own views and so on, but nothing he can do as long as he doesn't get the green light from somewhere else, which is his superiors and so on. Um, we, this is a tough call now. Uh, one cannot predict what will happen, but something can happen now because, first of all, the, the problem is the, 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 the economic problem. And that is not solved. At least it started to move. The, the, the reserve which we have in the in the central bank uh, reserve in the IMF and so on. So that's slowly, slowly, if that's been released, that will address some of the basic issues in, in, in the country. But again, um, whether we will go in a massive terms in, a, in, a, in infrastructure projects and new initiatives and so on, for the time being, we are a bit calm on that. And I think there's no way that one can do because the situation is very, very unclear. Within the Caspian region, Afghanistan could benefit quite a bit, quite a bit as I was talking to you all the time, because closer in, in inter-regional links and, 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 and all the exports, what we have, the, the products and so on, can go to those countries. It is very important. Uh, U.S. role in, in the Caspian region, I, I consider is very crucial because, of course, now the energy crisis in Europe and the Russians' involvement in, in, in Ukraine and all kind, of, all kind of these type of elements. Uh, I think it's about time that U.S. should be putting more uh, sort of energies into the Caspian region. Uh, whatever happens in, 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 in Vienna in terms of the uh, nuclear deal with Iran, but I think things are moving in a little positive directions than used to be. So if that happens, the Iranian oil, gas and everything else could be pumped into somehow one way or the other through Caspian uh, to Europe and so on. So that will may limit, alleviate some of the uh, energy crisis at some point. These are some of the issues that I, I consider these are crucial that to be addressed at, at, at some point. But my, I'm, I'm very sorry to say that I'm not very optimistic in the current situation in Afghanistan and that Afghanistan has been the centerpiece of the entire uh, transit hub, basically, I'd rather call it, um, to the north, south, east, west, all over places. Uh, but that has not been happening now. Uh, with, with the hope that something will happen in, in the next few months and so on, we wait for that part. This is just to, I'll, I'll give you some, some ideas. Uh, thank you, Sham. One question from my side. Uh, I saw in the news that during the last uh, months or so, uh, the, uh, Afghanistan and Turkmenistan restarted active discussions about the TAPI pipeline, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, in the pipeline. And uh, uh, the new regime uh, in Afghanistan, there is some kind of trying to guarantee the security of the project. Uh, what do you think, uh, first of all, whether it is realistic now to guarantee the security of such super giant project, first, and uh, second, uh, if Afghanistan somehow will be a safe transit country, this project could be interesting also for Pakistan and India on top. Still, despite the political turbulence that's happened. Indeed. Uh, when they say they will secure the pipeline, that I take is, is a very positive step. Because who can guarantee the, in the current situation anything? Pipeline is, of course, is a big project, but let's say anything except Taliban. They are the one who could uh, who control the whole regions, whole states, and so on. Uh, so that is a positive thing which is happening. Yes, I I was actually speaking uh, 
to my former colleague Ojan on that subject. Yes, it, it is something very positive uh, if that happens. <coughs> um, but again, it will only succeed if there is some sort of pressure on them and ensure them that you got to do it. And if you do it, we'll give you the stick with carrot. That thing has to be there in between. And of course, this, this project benefits quite a bit, not only Pakistan, India, and plus ourselves, and may, maybe maybe model for many other such projects as well. That is certainly, yeah, this is something positive has happened. But Taliban has the potential and has the power to, to give the currency and the security for that, that they do. Okay, now at least some positive news we're getting. Uh, because I hope so. As you told, if this project will be materialized, all involved countries uh, will have so huge benefits. And, uh, and Afghanistan, just they need to, uh, to guarantee the security and nothing else. And then it will Indeed. be like a constant income of the hard currency to the economy. Uh, thank you, Sham. Uh, now I would like to invite Bart uh, Turtleboom. Uh, He is an entrepreneur, he is a businessman, uh, he uh, did a business, successful business with Uzbekistan. He was working at the beginning of, of his career in the International Monetary Fund, I see, in the Deutsche Bank, uh, and uh, also John Hopkins University. Uh, ah, you, are still, you are still there, like senior fellow at the School of Advanced International Studies. And uh, I would like Bart uh, uh, to share his uh, experience dealing with the Greater Kazakhstan region and also his, recommend his recommendation as the international businessman. What could be improved? What could be uh, uh, changed uh, in the region in order to attract foreign investments, in order to attract international business there and, uh, and uh, for, for the successful cooperation? Please. Well, th thank you very much for uh, uh, the invitation to this panel with these uh, distinguished gentlemen um, on the um, on the video conference here. Um, the, I mean, obviously, to state the obvious, uh, we, we, we kind of live in highly unusual times. And I do think that from the perspective of the countries in the region, um, there, there is an immediate priority to deal with, and then there is a medium-term priority to deal with. The immediate priority to deal with is that The global supply chain issues that we've talked about over the past couple of years have now been exacerbated by the global, what I call the global financial supply chain issues by throwing a bunch of Russian banks out of the SWIFT system. We should absolutely, totally not underestimate the implications of that. And I was actually just, just half an hour ago before this call, this conference, I was on a call with uh, the CEO of a bank in Uzbekistan, and they're already rerouting their SWIFT transactions through Turkey to stay away. So it, it's, this, this, is a highly, this is a highly complex situation um, that the banking system globally is dealing with and that the banking system, particularly in Central Asia, is dealing with, given their historical reliance on financing from, uh, from Russian banks. So that's an immediate priority to deal with, and that's going to be quite challenging to do so. In the medium term, to, it's very clear that if you look at a country like Uzbekistan, which I think today in the world has the most ambitious economic transformation agenda in the world. They, this government is genuinely trying to, from the ground up, re-engineer the entire economy. We are active in helping them expand, rebuild, develop their educational system. We're active with state-owned banks on their ESG ratings. We're, we, 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 we cut through a, a swath of the economy. But the sheer ambition in terms of privatizations, in terms of development of public services, in terms of the delivery of public services, is second to none and is now facing the reality of A, a new world to finance those things, and B, the security context in which it is taking place is going to be very significant. And clearly, and, and, and sadly, Afghanistan is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a very sad example of that, relying for the security of the countries in the region on one external ally is going to become a more and more dangerous thing. They're going to have to stand on their own feet and they're going to have to deal with their security and rely in terms of both the defense of the country and the delivery uh, stand on their own feet. 
all of these things are needless to say incredibly complex, but I'm very happy to see that both from a political stability perspective and in terms of a, a policy agenda perspective, it does seem to me that Uzbekistan is in an absolutely fantastic position to make tremendous progress over the next five years, despite the challenges uh, that the region poses. I want to make one additional observation that goes beyond the region. The current crisis also highlights the difficulty of excluding countries like Venezuela and Iran from the global supply chain. So I do think we're in for a, revisit, a revisiting of that policy as well. How it will end, I do not know. But clearly, um, you know, the, 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 the rubber is meeting the road. Let's put it that way. Thank you, Bart. Uh, and from my side, I can confirm every, every word you, to, you told about Uzbekistan, uh, because I'm sharing the same opinion, and I'm very optimistic uh, about the country development. And uh, I'm admiring uh, how the president and the government are really pushing these reforms ahead, uh, despite uh, like the difficult uh, heritage they have from the previous government, from the Karimov's time. And uh, we hope that uh, Uzbekistan will really will be the star of the world economic uh, society. Uh, and uh, there's a good example for the other countries of the Greater Caspian region, even for other parts of the world, uh, how you could really move and develop the country in a very short time. Okay, uh, we, are, we have still two minutes only, and uh, I would like uh, to thank all, of, all our speakers today for the exceptional contribution and uh, very interesting discussions and information which uh, uh, Horace's audience could obtain from this session. Uh, this session will be then uh, downloaded via YouTube, and then uh, we can see it. We know that now more or less 25 sessions go in, in parallel in Horace's event. That's why we don't have too much audience. Uh, live, but uh, everybody could uh, see the session after. And uh, special thanks uh, to Dr. Frank Richter uh, for organizing uh, for us this United States of America event 2022. And all of us uh, were anxiously waiting uh, for the Horace's global event, uh, which I think still will be virtual. Uh, and more, uh, moreover, uh, we are really waiting when we will restart doing live meetings and we can meet each other and discuss uh, with the coffee or tea uh, on the Horasis events. And I think in autumn we will have the first one. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you for our audience. Uh, thank you for the interest uh, to the Greater Caspian region. And we hope for the best for our world in this difficult time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.